Just give me a few more seconds, it's coming up. And everybody should just mute themselves. Okay. Hi, everyone. We will begin very shortly. Um, there's like over 100 of y'all on here. <laughs> so we will um, be starting very shortly. So everyone, please just have some patience. We just have some a little technical difficulty. So um, thank you all for joining us this evening. I also want to remind everyone that tonight's um, series will be recorded and so, um, and it will be recorded in English and Creole. Um, and we will have the interpretation team these giving instructions in a few minutes. Okay. Hi, again, thank you everyone for being with us this evening. Um, my name is Francesca Menes and I'm with the Black Collective, one of the um, core organizations that is putting on this series for you all. Um, I am um, again with the Black Collective, an organization that is focused on shifting Black political and economic power here in South Florida. I'm going to pass it over to our interpretation team who is going to give instructions because this is going to be in both English and Haitian Creole. So Debbie or Rose? Good evening. My name is Natasha and I'm one of your interpreter. I will be um, interpreting in Haitian Creole with my colleague, Debbie Etienne, um, under the um, company MARB Language Services. Um, it is important to be able to communicate and participate in the language that we are most comfortable in. Um, that's why you have the language interpretation function with the Zoom meeting that you are attending today. In order to use this function, if you are on a computer or a laptop, you will see in the bottom of your screen a little globe. I just click on the globe that says interpretation and you will have a choice of language. Uh, pick Haitian Creole if you want to participate and listen to the, the meeting in Haitian Creole. If you do not want to listen to it in Creole, uh, please pick English because if we have to interpret from Haitian Creole to English, English speaking need to be able to um, understand as well. If you are on a phone or a tablet, you will see three little dots in the bottom of your screen. Click on them, it says more. And again, pick your language and do not forget to click done in order to enter the, the language channel of your choice. Alors bonjour, bonsoir tout le monde. Nom c'est Natasha, moi là avec collègue moi Debbie Etienne et nous pral offrir un service d'interprétation en créole haïtien. Euh, 
si nous voulons communiquer ou bien participer en créole haïtien, il y a une fonction dans Zoom nan, qui permet de faire ça. Si vous regardez en bas écran, vous avez un petit globe terrestre, vous avez cliqué sur lui et vous avez choisi la langue que vous voulez. Si ou pas parler créole ou parler anglais seulement, il est pas bon pour nous cliquer sur anglais pour nous attendre interprétation qu'a fait en anglais si on monde qu'a fait intervention en créole. Si nous pas voulez pour nous gain bruit de fond, cliquez sur mute original audio. Si c'est son téléphone que nous y est, ou après trois petits points en bas à droite et quand téléphone nous, cliquez sur lui, il est supposé dire more. Encore une fois, ou avez choisi langue que vous voulez participer ou bien tendez rencontre ça et puis pas oublier pour cliquer donne pour qu'on rentre dans channel langue que vous voulez. Si nous pas parler tant pis qu'un ben micro nous fait main et là n'a fait intervention s'il vous plaît parlez avec un ton qui modéré. Uh, if you are not speaking please make sure that your microphone is closed and if you are making a, a comment or talking please in a moderate space so that we can capture all the information for you. Thank you and good evening. Thank you so much Natasha and now I'm going to pass it over to Leonie. Merci, Natasha. Good evening. Good evening. Bonsoir tout le monde. Bonsoir tout le monde. Uh, welcome to part two of the Ransom, uh, the Ransom Haiti Stolen Wealth virtual series. My name is Leonie Elmatin. I was born in, grew up in Port-au-Prince, Pétionville. Uh, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that my dad was from Petit Guave, the imperial town of Petit, city of Petit Guave, and my mother from the historic city of Arcaïe. Uh, I uh, live in Miami, where I'm the director of development and communication at St. La Haitian Neighborhood Center. And on behalf of uh, my executive director, Gypsy Metellus, and the entire St. La family, I bring you greetings. Um, Santla is a Miami-based Miami not-for-profit so social service organization whose mission is to strengthen, empower, and uplift South Florida's Haitian community. We serve over 16,000 clients a year, providing mission-aligned services grounded in strategies like economic empowerment, family strengthening, and community building. Joining us in this virtual series project are collective Haitian-led organizations who share a commitment to bring Haitian history to the center and unite with all who believe in a vision of a Haiti uh, that is truly free to build on our own future. Thank you to the Black Collective, Haitian American Foundation for Democracy, St. La Haitian Neighborhood Center, Island TV, Ibo Post, Haitian American Professional Coalition, HAPSI, and Avancé Ensemble. This is a three-part three series of virtual conversations focused on increasing our collective understanding of what happened after Haiti became the first Black independent nation in the Western Hemisphere. We read the New York Times comprehensive account of the ransom, the lost billions, the true cost of freedom and its present day impacts. Our goals for this virtual series are to continue to keep this historic, this, this history in the public attention, amplify the learnings and galvanize for collective action. For today's conversation, we welcome our panelists, Jessica Genius, Dr. Mame Fatunyang, and Dr. Marlena Delt. They will engage in conversation about the impact of the series on what we have called reframing our narratives. The conversation will be moderating, moderated by one of our national treasurers, Edwidge Natika, who really needs no introduction. And so we look forward to your questions after the discussion. So, Madame Natika. Merci, Leonie. Um, bonsoir tout le monde. Uh, good evening. It's wonderful to see so many of you. Um, old friends, new friends. Um, thank you for coming. So tonight our discussion is reframing our narrative uh, about Haiti, reframing the narrative about Haiti. 
Um, with part one, we discussed the making of the series with the journalists, Catherine Porter and Constant Mayu. We're here last week with uh, moderators Magali Laguerre, Wilkinson, and Joel Dreyfus, uh, who is like, a, you know, an OG for us in, in, in the, the world of uh, Haitian journalism and in the community. Um, with part two, this part is reframing the narrative, and we're going to focus on ways we can use the series to reframe and debunk disempowering narratives about Haiti. Why we must stop repeating that Haiti is the poorest country in the West, Western Hemisphere, and how we can challenge ourselves and others to define, to redefine who we are with greater nuance and complexity. Um, next week will be what's next: repairing Haiti and the global movement for reparations. So. In this great endeavor, we have three wonderful speakers. I will introduce them, and then we'll, we'll jump right into the discussion. Um, so first is Dr. Marlena Doubt. She is professor of French and African-American studies at Yale University. She's the author of Baron de Vasté and the Origins of Black Atlantic Humanism and Tropics of Haiti, Race, and the Literary History of the Haitian Revolution in the Atlantic World. She's also co-editor and co-translator of the volume Haitian Revolutionary Fictions, an anthology. Her next book, An Intellectual History of Haiti, titled Awakening the Ashes, is forthcoming with the University of North Carolina in the fall of 2023. Professor Doubt is currently writing a biography of King Henry Christophe for Canop Pantheon, and her essays have appeared in newspapers and magazines such as the New York Times, The Nation, Essence, and Harper's Bazaar, among others. She's a co-creator and co-editor of HNet Common Digital Platform, HIT, H Haiti, and she curates a website on early Haitian print culture. She also co-edits the Global Black History and Theory section at Public Books and is a series editor at New World Studies at UVA Press. Professor Doubt received her BA from Loyola Marymount University and her PhD from the University of Notre Dame. She previously taught at the University of Miami, Claremont Graduate University, and the University of Virginia. Mam, Dr. Mam Fatou Nyang is Associate Professor of French and Francophone Studies at Carnegie Mellon University. She's the author of Identité Française and the co-author with Julien Sodo of Universalisme. Her recent research examines universalism and Blackness in France. In 2015, she co-directed Marianne Noir, Mosaïque afro Pn, a film which seven Afro-French women unravel what it means to be Black and French, Black and France. Dr. Nyang is currently working on a manuscript tentatively titled Mosaica Nigra, Blackness in 21st Century Friends. And Jessica Geneus, true national treasure, <laughs> uh, started her acting career at 17, playing in Barricade, a long feature by Richard Senegal. She then collaborated with various local and international film directors like Raoul Peck and Moloc Tropical, Toussaint Louverture, directed by Philippe Nyang and produced and by France 2, by France 2. In 2011, Jessica was granted a scholarship to study at Acting International School in Paris. Back in Haiti, she founded her own production company, Aïsien Productions. In 2014, she directed Visage Nou and later Duvan Joux, Calévé, The Sun Will Rise, her first documentary for French television, Freda, her first feature film premiered at the Cannes, at the Cannes Film Festival and the Ernst Regard selection. The film came out in theaters in France and has been touring festivals around the world. Freda has won more than 20 awards since its release. So we are talking to people, powerhouses who have already been reframing uh, the narrative about Haiti in their own way. So I wanted to start because we are, uh, the discussion is anchored um, in this series. I wanted to start by asking your reactions to the series. Um, anybody can start, feel free. <laughs> 
I'll jump in. <laughs> um, I mean, I think my first reaction was, you know, um, probably similar to many, we want as many people uh, to know about this story as possible. So um, seeing it, I knew the, the story was in the works for a while and had conversed with the journalist. So I knew it was coming. I didn't know when, um, and I didn't fully realize the scope of it. So um, to see it on the front page, um, for several days, over many days, and taking up that much uh, journalistic real estate, I think is actually really, really important. Um, despite the fact that there are questions about, you know, why hadn't the New York Times covered this story before? Um, I tend to be a believer in better late than never. Um, so I was, um, you know, gratified to see it there and want and hope the conversation continues and deepens and becomes more extensive to the point of action. And so very happy to be a part of this series. And thank you to everyone um, involved in coordinating it. Can go. Um, I mean, following Marlena's step, I was really excited. Actually, I found myself in the odd position of having to defend a journal that I stopped reading a long, long time ago. Uh, because I mean, as, as you know, in France, the, the reaction um, varied a lot from complete silence from French official. The, the piece actually came in the middle of a government shift. So they used it as an excuse, but we know that even without that, um, the government was not going to, to address the issue as we know the country's long time resistance and denial about the topic. And um, online and on social media, it was an explosion. I mean, just thinking about the conversation that I had at home with people in my family, looking at what's happening online in France with just one recurring question, how was it possible? I mean, how was it possible to hide all of this? And when I talk about defending the, the New York Times, this is a, as part of a conversation that I had with the headmaster of my former primary school, who asked me if the information was real and if this was not you know, a case of just French bashing from an American media trying to settle scores with the United States that as, the, as America was globally shamed um, after the, the George Floyd affair. So I had to tell people that this is real. They, I mean, Haiti was a French colony. And I think these are things that we'll also discuss toward the piece, but um, we, we had, we, as scholars working on this topic and working on this maybe longer than the New York Times had been trying to cover it, we were, we were, you know, we had conversation about some of the, the tones of the series, like how new it was and the central sensationalist headlines and, and, you know, the conversation about North American historians feeling excluded of a story about Haiti, I don't know, we might cover this, but, you know, anything that at least in my side of the world in France, got people reading. I mean, we, we had a surge in articles, paid articles on Haiti from France. So anything that would get my people moved to want to learn, to actually pay, get books, um, academic books, go over paywall to read articles, I'll take it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I have to, I, I was, we're being told to remind the speakers to slow down okay. for the for interpretation, so I'll keep that in mind okay. um, too, and Jessica. <laughs> no, yes. Um, first of all, it was really painful to read. And on every aspect, it was painful because, I don't know, we've been talking about that, you know, on, the, on so many levels in Haiti. And at first, when we were talking about it, or when, when you would hear about it, especially around 2004, you would think more of it as a joke, you know, as something that, yeah, they are probably laughing back, you know, where they are seeing us um, asking for that money, but it wasn't funny when they took it. And, and the other thing that was painful also is, I was more obsessed about the after. Like I, I was obsessed mm -hmm. about, what is this gonna generate, you know? Because if it's more talking, then I'm up for it. Yeah, I, we can talk. But I was really curious about how embarrassed can we make them? Like how embarrassed can this can make them? And is there any room for them, you know, to feel any type of, you know? Um, okay, let's at least do something, even, you know, the little thing. And I can tell you that it's, still early of course but i'm still in the pain of not seeing enough of this and 
yeah, this is where I am with this article <laughs> because <laughs> because it's 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 yeah, I see how it how it exploded and I see I saw everything and nowadays unfortunately so many things are exploding the internet so you you want it to just pulverize it or just <laughs> make it blow away and so you can actually get what it it meant to you know to do um obviously so yeah mm -hmm. i mean i for me i remember you know in 2004 there was like a big year for thomas jefferson and i was asked to write something and the thing i ended up writing was said ignoring the revolution next door about you know about this debt and people were the re response when the comments was like you get you're always making excuses mm -hmm. for for haiti and so i think part of it was that like you had this link now that you can send to people who were saying that to you who thought you kind of were over explaining but i'm always thinking too uh, about the next generation of of people in our own families to whom this is all as vague sometimes as as the rest of the world that that to also have this thing this sort of mainstream thing that you you can share with them um was also important in this way and i was thinking of you know i was thinking of michelle wolf to you um and you know who warned us you know that we can't underestimate the fact that history is is produced in overlapping sites right and that that people learn average citizens sometimes access histories through celebrations sites visits you know holidays and and now I get to to the internet but I think part of uh, even in what I think in this series and in daily life you wrestle with when something like that comes out is why why is it why is it important why is all this stuff we've been telling each other and not enough like why is it why, why are these site specific access type moments important? Or is it fair that they are so important? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And it's about what you said also, you know, because every time you would say those things, they will always come to you like, look at you, like, do you think you're, that you're so important, you know? Because those is, <laughs> they managed so well to hide it. And even I remember when I when I went to Paris to study, the first shock that I had was when my fellow, you know, the student at the school where I was, when I, they asked me where I was coming from, where, where do you come from? And I said, Haiti. And they're like, Tahiti? I said, no, Haiti. And I had to repeat it a couple of times. And, and <laughs> I could not bear the fact that they couldn't, they didn't even know that the island exists, that the island exists, that the island exists. And I said, we've been going to, you know, studying in French, doing everything based on, you know, what your country has imposed in that island, yet you don't even know that it existed. So all those, of course, narratives is to make us exist. But I think at this point of the conversation, I don't even, like, I don't even care that if they know that it exists. I want consequences of actions, you know, and the feeling and when when this something so big happened and you feel like the answer is not coming or will probably will never come i feel like it makes me feel more powerless than i was before it's like i could hide in the fact before that they didn't know nobody knew you know it's not proven blah 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 and now that it is proven and published in probably you know one of the biggest newspaper like the credibility is you know it's very hard to 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 doubt it and to, to still feel like your scream is coming back in your throat. I, 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 honestly, I, I didn't manage to deal with that yet. And maybe I'm too emotional, of course, I'm too emotional, whatever, you know, I'm not pragmatic enough. But I, I, I hope in this conversation also to listen from you all, you know, how do you cope up with that? How do you stay grounded and continue, you know, and continue in the path, even though you feel like you're definitely not being heard the way you're supposed to, you know. I mean, I wanna, I'm, I'm going to jump on this conversation, of course, as an Afro-French woman and uh, as a scholar working on Blackness, uh, French colonialism, its history, contemporary products. And, and I think of two points, you know, from what, what, you, what you both just said. 
the sheer ignorance about Haiti and its relation to France. I mean, it's just astonishing in France. And the, the second point being the long held belief in France that Haiti is silent, so mute, it's poor, it's failing when we know, you know, from our research and work in life that Haiti is not mute, it's been silenced, it's not poor, it's been impoverished, it's, it's not failing, it has been failed. And we've all, we're all accustomed, you know, to the chorus, the dance on French media or any, you know, Western media, you talked about it, Edwige, the, uh, the public discourse. They want this. After each natural or, or man-made disaster, like le, le pays le plus pauvre de l'hémisphère nord, l'île maudite, etc. And I, I hear what you say, Jessica, about, um, you know, being able to, to, to give an excuse because ignorance is here. And now that the ignorance has been lifted, what, what I mean, what's next, right? This kind of, if it's souffle, we talked about the information, it shared, and then I, I think that we have to, this is really what helped us going, you know, many of us to just keep to the really going. You know, um, I was an English slash history major graduating from a top program in France, and it is in the United States as an exchange student at the age of 26. I'm coming from a top history program that I learned that Haiti was a French colony, that I heard of Saint-Domingue for the first time. And this is still a sad reality for many you know, fr French people. You know, we think of President Jacques Chirac a few years ago who famously stated, this is the president of France, that Haiti was not a French colony per se, but a place with whom we shared a common language. And you know, we wonder how that happened and a failed country that France have long sought to help and assist as part of the, its humanitarian mission. So the extent to which this history, the country has been wiped from French national memory is just absolutely, I mean, it's, it's very hard to comprehend. And to analyze that, Edrich, you mentioned Tuyo, we have to go back to Tuyo, this like notion of the unthinkable and how in France this history was dropped as hot potato because one, it did not fit the victorious tale, you know, the myth that we created about the Republic, rights, equality, Frenchness, and two, philosophically, Haiti's very birth questioned the inconsistencies of our universalist narrative. And just to finish, I remember Paulina, it was last year or two years ago when you wrote that beautiful piece when France extorted Haiti Right? and how the revolution was failed through lack of diplomatic rec recognition, heavy taxes, the intellectual um, isolation, and, and you spoke of the ransom. Do you remember that? It broke French people to the brink of madness. I mean, who is this woman? Why is she making up this story? We didn't do anything to Tahiti, right? Why is she accused of all these things, like the greatest haste in history, where all we've always done is to send medicine and drugs, and and so it's really and and I and I absolutely hear you know this the, the fact that you might feel despair, but when you understand the depth of ignorance and cultivated ignorance that we're coming from in this history, I take anything as a, a victory because it, it's as if it's so hard to move the machine. The machine does not want to move. So anything that makes that give us, you know, the feeling of the impression that it's waving a little bit is to be taken. And I believe as someone who's been working on this for close to 20 years, that the article of the New York Times has moved things a little bit in France. Hmm. Yes. But is it, mm. is it, is it ignorance or denial? Because denial is stronger than ignorance, and I'm afraid. I'm more afraid of denial than ignorance. You know, I work with I work with Mill's type of ignorance, an ignorance that is cultivated, an ignorance that is not just of an uneducated masses, but an ignorance that is coming from an elite. And you know, so it's that's I'm I'm talking about that type of ignorance that is passed on, that is cuddled, nurtured, fed, okay. and we just don't want to don't want to listen and hear. So when things like the series appear, I mean, how do we deal with that? How do we deal with, and, and I think that this is stronger to me than denial. It's it's really, we don't want to know, it's another page of our history, but history is is stubborn, right? You, um, and what is happening is that right now people are realizing that in these beautiful manicured um, pages of our national history with all these great men from Michelet to Renan to the Pierres and the Louise and the Françoise, we jump from page three to page 20 and there are, you know, 16 pages that were blue and those pages are called Saint-Domingue and Haiti and we are going to have to patiently unglue them. It's the realization that we have now in France. Mm. I, would, I would say also, um, 
you know, I taught in France um, high school and so had the exact uh, Tahiti experience, but also with the hula, a little bit of hula dance uh, in there as well. Um, and, you know, the sort of idea that, you know, also questioning, you know, how come uh, the US had slavery and saying to the students in Seconde, France had slavery too, engaged in slavery as well. And the looks on their faces that it's just not a part of the curriculum. And so, um, you know, being told by French scholars, I would say um, that, you know, none of these things really happened is like the pages of Tuyo uh, coming to life, um, you know, walking around you and, and whispering in your ear all of his so, such resonant phrases, um, which made me think, you know, there's denial there's silencing, there's lying though. And to me, that is all gaslighting. And the French people and the French state absolutely have to stop gaslighting the Haitian people and the Haitian state from Jacques Chirac saying, oh, for Haiti wasn't really a French colony, but the other French presidents as well saying, we owe a debt to Haiti and then walking it back and say, no, I mean a moral debt. All of the things that the that uh, the French people in their comments online on social media, all of that anger and vitriol that they, uh, you know, spout at anybody who speaks of this history is a form of gaslighting designed. It has nothing to do with truth. It has nothing to do with politics. It has everything to do with simply denying something that is as plain as day. And the fact that what the New York Times did was lay it out before them in a manner uh, that is undeniable, um, I think will have, I hope, lasting power, but needs to have not just narrative power. And I know our panel is a lot about narrative, but it, we do have to continue to put the pressure on the French government and the French people to force something to happen. Because um, mom might remember this when a prominent French scholar told me, the problem is, is that most French people don't know this history. If they knew this history, they would be outraged and they would want to do something about it. I said, well, let's test the theory. And that was several years ago before the heist article came out, which was also in French. Other scholars, as we know, in Haiti, around the world have been working on this. Thomas Piketty has been working on this. The French people can know if they want to know. And the only people who can make France pay, I have said this for years, is are the French people. They know how to force their government to do something. And it is their will and their striking and their desire that will force their government to take action. They are the only ones. And so for them to say, look at your country, which is what they look at Haiti, look at the United States. Well, I'm looking at you, France, because we need action and we need uh, the, the denial to stop that that's only one step. Mm -hmm. We need the re repayment, compensation and reparation uh, to begin as the next step. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I mean, I think uh, sort of the, the part of the article that's discussed less often is the American part, right? Because they're gaslighting us too. They're still ga gaslighting us like to this day. Um, and the sort of the, the financial burden of that, I don't know if it's because uh, it's more like the sort of the article is more to a, a particular institution as opposed to sort of the greater American um, empire through this occupation that was 19 years and, and all that, that that brought us. Um, so I think there's uh, the American part was that, is there something to be also demanded of, of the United States? And which, is, which was sort of less covered by, by the article. I think also they got a little sort of cover from, from the extent of the French work. But you know, you know also it was what, what has been complicated for me, and maybe I'm completely wrong in what I'm saying, but I realized that to count on morality is not always, you know. And and that's why maybe I'm angry because I know that the pressure has to be institutional and the pressure has to come from us because they are talking about us. And again, they are talking about us, but we're expecting you know, um, 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 a movement somewhere else. And, and I can't, I, it's hard for me to believe in that movement, you know, because we, we know how it happened. It's whether it's a political context that makes something, you know, sparkle and happen a certain way for the people. 
it, or, or specific, you know, events or things like that, but to naturally have, you know, a country to, to realize something and naturally go and say that we're going to do this. Okay. We, we are taking action to, I, I, you know, I'm having a hard time to, to, to see, and that's what is hard for me, you know, and I, I don't see how us on our side and like, like uh, Martin was saying, to put pressure, you know, how do we apply pressure? What power do we have to apply pressure? Because people only listen to you when you have a certain type of power, whether it's political power, you know, or, or financial power, or whatever it is, or interest, it has to be strong. And although we have it, we still haven't been able to use it in our favor, you know? They, they still have always been able to come and take and do what they want to do. And this is what this article showed that almost drove me crazy because it's the way, the way that you see that they came, they literally, like it was their, it's their backyard. It's like, you know, the United States have been calling us their backyard for, I mean, it's, it's, it literally happened like that. They, they came in, they, they did that, you know? And, and it's, it's, it's hard for me to realize how, even though I understand um, what, what, what mommy you were, you were saying, about the fact that it will change. Of course it will change because they, they will have to talk about it in spaces that it was not talked about, you know? They will have to start um, um, ignore it, but they have the power also to erase it again to a certain level, at least in their circle, you know, at least in, mm -hmm. in, in, in their, so that's, that's where I'm, 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 and also in this article, they, were, they, they, were, they keep saying the slave, the slaves, is it? Enslaved. We we are not slaves. We were enslaved. It's completely different. It's it's different. It's different. It's different. And it's important for me to for it to be said. Like I know it sounds ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I remember you know growing up when we were studying in 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 Asian history book. You know, they would say, "Oh, Chris, Christopher Columbus came with his guy, and they did that." And you know, the indigenous people that were there, they were too tired and too weak. So they died by, you know, thousands and thousands. So they had to bring us from Africa because we were stronger. And the way they, they framed, you know, the way they told the story made you, made you be proud of being strong and that they went to look for you in Africa to come replace people that were weak. So growing up, you're thinking about the thing. You're not thinking about the crime and everything that has been, you know, done to you. You're thinking about, oh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm strong, I'm black, I'm strong. They kept the strongest one because, you know, they, they, they were really hard in how they select us and everything. So all those things I'm thinking now, they're not subtle and they're not to be ignored, you know, how we use, how we use the term, how we say we're not slaves. We were enslaved by criminals and it's completely different. And to, to, to call me a slave, it literally show, it tell me that that's, how, that's what, I, you know, that's who I've been my whole life. That I don't have a story before colonization and I don't have a story before, you know, whatever they decided that I, that I am. So, yeah. I, I, I hear you. I absolutely hear, um, you know, what, what you say. And actually, this is, this is what struck me when I was, when I read the, the title of our of our panel, uh, it's, we're not reframing the narrative, we're reframing our narrative. And when I look at this, I'm, I'm called to come from, you know, the impetus is from here, right? How do I approach this as a black woman, um, of, as a French woman of black heritage, living in a country where I'm told that race doesn't exist, where, you know, I'm a seventh generation French person and everywhere I go, because my name sounds foreign, I'm asked where I'm from. So how am I in a country where citizenship doesn't matter, but there's something about me, something that doesn't have a word because, you know, we don't say blackness in French that always place me outside. So to, to bring us back to, to this idea of reclaiming our narrative, um, I, I really like how you talk of circles, Jessica. And for me, these circles are super important because we are faced with, a, with something so powerful, something that um, has the capacity to reinvent itself, something that literally ate, like, you know, the, the entire world, colonialism ate the world. How do I fight that? without dying within this, this small space that is my body and within the small time that I have on this earth, right? And you compare that with the space 
that the, 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 these monsters occupy physically and in time. And for me, one thing that has been very important is this idea of intimacy and working in small circle. We can't fight this, right, through, or even think that this, this or the series will take care of this problem, because exactly of what you say, how do you fight something so immoral right and to me one thing that's that's very interesting is when we talk of the idea of reparation i was very troubled i mean how do you repair you know the anguish of a man who's seeing his enslaved woman rape in front of him how do you repair all the impossible futures how do we repair the generational trauma how do you repair um, you know, the fact that generational wealth was in How do you repair all of that, right? You can't, but one thing that we can, that we can at least try is to have this start from us, repairing myself, repairing the way I see myself within this history, repairing the way I see these other lines. And one of the line, I mean, as a black French person, the beginning line, the baseline for us is Haiti. I will explain this later talking about blackness in France, the baseline is Haiti. So how do I repair myself through this a little, through intimate circle that start with me and through, um, you know, a confidence of time that goes beyond the time that my physical body will be on earth. And this is what we do when, for example, in France, we push around the rhetoric of surprise, even in this article around the current climate, right? Many people seem lost or struck by the novelty of the event, but we've lived with these silences and through this companionship with time, this companionship with silence, we've acquired something, you know, like a sense of a longer history of, a, of the present and a different sense of temporality, ones that is not linear, you know, life, life, you born, you birth, life, death, but one that is, you know, like spiralist and in which the rotation of times inevitably unearths skeletons and hidden secrets. So these secrets are coming out one by one. Think not everything will happen in my lifetime, but I'm okay with that because for me, the first act of restoration is an act of restoration with myself. If the Palais de l'Elysée or the president doesn't want to see that, no, Let, let's at least work, try, try to work that you know, a knowledge that something exists, something that needs repair. And this is where we are right now, at least on this side of the Atlantic, that something was broken, that it was stolen, mishandled, and a knowledge that a crime occurred here through slavery, colonization, the ransom, and the contemporary consequences of those crimes, you know, how they are still plaguing Haiti. So the question in France, but also the, the US, I mean, at which you, you did a great thing um, talking about how the US was kind of, you know, uh, spread by the article. And the question that was reactualized by this series is how do we reshape a narrative that never took shape or one that, that was shaped in, in invisibility and the violence of silence? How do we in, in our various positions using our crafts, our languages, you know, theory, art, cinema, painting, etc. How do we participate in the weaving of this collective tapestry while also taking care of our physical and, and, and um, you know, mental, mental health? And to me, it can only happen when we work in, the, in, in these small circles, you know. You know. Mm -hmm. I would just say, I agree with you, mom. Um, but I think I'm not sure that it starts with this stuff because in Haiti right now, the situation is so dire and extreme that to care for oneself is actually a tall or to that. This is the way I like it. So Nitu Guladi, my colleague at the University of Virginia and his students, their research paper was cited in the ransom yeah. piece. They are actually preparing legal documents and legal briefs based on the principle of damages, because when people are harmed by other people, there is, of course, the actual material harm they suffer, which is the amount of the indemnity itself, but there is payment for pain and suffering. There is payment for lost opportunities. There is payment for consequences that are unforeseen in the future. And so to me, I want to not, you know, sort of make myself crazy by, you know, being on this quest. Um, but I do think that what Jessica said before about embarrassing the French 
people in the French government, they do care. They call the New York Times sometimes. They get upset. They <laughs> harass us, as you know, online, in our homes. They are, it is having some effect. The question is, we don't want it to have a personal, individual effect. We want it to have an institutional, broader effect. And we want whatever happens to benefit the Haitian people um, of today who are living in Haiti right now, suffering the consequences, I firmly believe, of this unjust debt and of all of the narratives that cropped up around to support it. Because the stereotyping of Haiti, all of, it's not separate from the, from the physical harm done to Haitians under slavery. What did we see? Tons and tons of narratives justifying Africans are barbaric. They're like this, they're like that. They can't be civilized, their language. It's all of a piece to deny people their humanity in order to take their resources, um, whether the, that's their labor and their body and their families under slavery or their actual resources, their land um, during the US occupation and other occupations after that. And so for me, I want to see material consequences and I want to, I, I, I hope the, the harm can be repaired, I would say. I hope it can be repaired. I don't think money is the only way, but I think it is a crucial piece because if people cannot live, then they can't work on their hearts and their minds and their spirits. They have, the body has to also be intact, I would say. Absolutely. I, I was told again to remind our speakers to slow down for the interpretation. It's, it's hard with all the passion, which is, which is um, warranted and, and, and incredible. I, want to in terms of I want to talk about and we're like in reframing our narrative and this idea that uh, you all uh, sort of waded into a little bit of who is us who who is this us and um, and this narrative is it are we reframing it by sort of broadening this coalition of who we are of claiming people that were scattered from us in this experience of diaspora or finding parallel struggles throughout the world. And, and also this, this idea of um, a series of wrongs leading to sort of where we are today. So how do we, how do we reframe the narrative? Is it by broadening it, by taking others in, by by just not staying in the past, but also talking about the present as you were, uh, Marlena, and, I, and I, as I know is Jessica is in Haiti and is sort of living the day to day. So how do we reframe that with the sort of broadest coalition possible on our road to its action? Hmm. Um, I, was, I was thinking, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer what you said, Idrich, but I was thinking about what Ma'am said about, you know, um, to find a way to 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 repair ourselves. <laughs> I would go as far as saying repairing, and I've been thinking about that a lot, especially especially when I'm writing, especially when, when I'm thinking about you know telling a story uh, through films, of course, uh, and. I've been thinking about how you rebuild yourself on the land, on the very land where the trauma happened. And, and it's like you have, it, there's so much to be done in order for that, you know, to, in order for you to even begin to think that it's possible. And, and uh, for example, in this, and in, in, in Freda was the obsession, the obsession of this little family that is living in this house where a trauma happened. And you have to, Kind of transform yourself while looking at all the those the elements that you know that generated that trauma and and people that generated too and sometimes those people are extremely close to your heart you know they are fathers mothers and you have to learn to look at them um, um while seeing that spot you know that spot that keeps staying there that says that this person contributed to something that was extremely harmful to you and when I'm thinking about Haiti, that's also what I think, you know, as, 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 as people, as a whole nation, this land, that the kind of fight that happened on this land was first a fight for survival. You know, it's not like, for example, when you think about the U.S., people came, people were, you know, running away from something. They came together and 
fought for this land together for them to stay there. But we had this fight just to survive, you know, what was happening during colonization with us. And then we had the fight where we, to, to reclaim our freedom and then, you know, to, to occupy the island as a nation. And, and, and when we did that, we were robbed, you know, from this article, you, you learn that we were robbed from the opportunity to build ourselves as a nation. So now you, you were treated as less than human. You managed to fight and yet they find a way to crush you again and put you back. And since that point, you were not able to bring yourself up to a certain level where you can consider now, you know, that you're, you're ready to collectively build this country. And this is, this has been, you know, I'm trying, when I think about it as big as Haiti and everything, it drives me crazy. So I try to <laughs> reduce it, you know, to, to, to the family level, to, to, to more five people living together and how. So when you're looking at them, you, you have to look at all the aspect of why it's so hard, you know, to rewrite their narrative so they can tell another story about themselves and see themselves differently because everything around them remind them of who they said, you know, that they say that they are. And that's why it's hard. That's why it make, that's what makes us go crazy when we hear something from outside because we, we just, we can't stand the fact that it's that constantly every day. You know, you want to say something else about Haiti, but when you live there and, and constantly you're addressed by everything that's happening outside, mm -hmm. where do you find a voice to, to, you know, to actually say, okay, I'm going to, today I'm not going to talk about Haiti. I'm not going to talk about, you know, that I couldn't go out in the street to simply go to the supermarket and buy stuff. I'm not, I'm going to talk about the beauty of our history, you know, and, and it's literally a work of meditation. It's literally work. Yeah. And some morning I manage for a few hours to do it. Yet I have the option of leaving. Yet I have the option of going, just leaving my house to go to somewhere more calm, you know, or leaving my house to go to another country. So now think about the millions that doesn't have and will never have that option. So how do you create that space of escape? And that's that's the space, you know, where you can say, oh, now I have a trauma and I need time to heal. And this is a, 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 something that you've never been able to say really in, in, in a lot of families in Haiti because this space doesn't exist. The space of healing doesn't exist and it has never been, you've never had access to it, you know? And so, so yes, I, I want to create it, and I, but I know also that it's one of those things, you know, that are easier said than done. And, and I, I, I don't know. And I'm, I'm really lost. Yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna let well, you. You, you are not lost. You're taking us exactly in the right places, the right question. Where, where do you find time to to localize everything that needs to be repaired. Um, who has the privilege of time? How do you address the earth, you know, the hurting and, and everything that's been broken when the brokenness is constantly surrounding you? How do you, what do you do to resist, um, you know, the alienation that comes with this constant question? And what do you do when survival is not just mental, but we're talking about literal survival. I mean, it is a question of life and death on a daily basis. Um, this was not lost. You took us exactly to the right question, Jessica. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> and and I, I think also, I mean, I think part of being a, a, a child of Haiti, a creator of Haiti, someone who has loved ones in Haiti, you always, in terms of reframing the narrative, I think we're always guided towards this easier thing where people are like, write about the beach, write, you know, tell good stories, tell happy stories while your relative is calling to collect, some, you know, like the, so it's, it's to collect like money for the ransom, another kind of ransom. But what is, um, I think it's the ability, and that's coming up in the chat, like how do we, reframing narratives, how do we think of ourselves without trauma, 
certainly, but also how do we carry all of that together? Like how, how do we, uh, and Jessica, you do it in your art and you all do it in your you know, scholarship, but I would love for us to explore a little bit, how do we tell multiple stories? How do we tell very complex multiple stories at the same time about beauty, certainly, but also about pain that doesn't sort of add further to our stigmatization. I think this is where, I mean, um, at least for me, the historical, um, focusing on the history of um, not just the Haitian revolution, but 19th century Haiti, independent Haiti, and what the leaders and the people collectively went through together as they tried in their infancy as a nation state to heal from that first generational trauma, which was colonialism and slavery and forced removal of the population, the indigenous population as well. And that I can see that in the earliest years, nothing, people were not perfect. We can certainly talk about what happened under Desaline and Christophe and Pétion and Boyer, but there was an effort to rebuild. There was an effort to um, restore joy and um, there was an effort to make the country prosperous. Um, and, I, and I think studying those narratives and bringing those, talking about those stories sort of lights different parts of my brain about um, how, how we can talk about the present day differently as well. Because of course, hardly anyone, I was gonna say no one is ever all good or all bad, but I don't know the last few, <laughs> the last few years in this country are teaching me that maybe that's not true. But, um, but, I, but I do think um, that the vision that the early, and you know, some of you may know I work on Henri Christophe, but the vision that people had, even in all of their imperfection, that there was actual beauty in that imperfection as well, and the culture and art that came out of the Christophian era, legacies that are with us today, and obviously we all know Haiti has an amazing art and musical and culinary um, culture, um, and but as I said, I don't know how, I still don't know how to get out of the conundrum of doing all of that. And then on the other hand, having a family member who has to suddenly leave uh, Haiti for a health crisis and has to get out because there's not health care that can help this person with this. I don't know how to hold all of that in my mind. And I wish I, wish I did, but um, I think it is one of our central dilemmas as Haitian Americans um, living in the diaspora as well. There's also something that I'm, I'm trying to learn, which is to see beauty differently. Um, you know, it's, and to look for it where, in what I'm exposed to. And I'm not talking about trash or whatever, <laughs> like, it's, I'm not talking about seeing, I'm talking about human, of course, and I'm talking about that situation between human and, and 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 dive into a place of understanding instead of a place of judgment, mm -hmm. and or to observe what's going on and 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 you know completely get rid of the the, the desire to judge because you you it's an impulse that is constantly there you know, and it's something that that I'm that I'm trying to do first for my work because I think. It's very boring to create something where it's all about judging one side. And I, I don't know, from my point of view, I think it's, I don't, I don't see how it would be useful. Um, um, so I'm always curious about the gray area. I'm always curious about, you know, um, um, people that you spontaneously would see as, as someone that needs to be, you know, um, um, categorized as whatever bad or whatever, what's going on, what brings us there, you know, what, what are the choices that we are making that is bringing, because I'm interested in the choices because the choices are the key to understand what, you know, what's happening at each state of our um, um, journey as a nation. And there, there are choices that we've, <laughs> we've made and it's hard to look at them because we are already in the painful state from something that is outside of our control, but we are suffering also because of things that are in our control. 
and 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 thinking about narrative and thinking about the article that's one thing also when they are mentioning all the people that were collaborating and helping into you know making this those all this money disappear all this not disappear because it went to someone's pocket so obviously all this money that went somewhere so to to actually look at the part that we are playing in in this destruction whether it's on a political level or on a personal level you know and on 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 choices that we are making and those choices i'm trying to learn not to see them as oh this person wants to destroy the country or this person wants to build the country this is how this person is making those choices in survival um um thinking and how do we minimize this survival influence, you know, the, the desire to constantly take decision in, in that survival um, bubble and, and think about something, you know, bigger. So how do we create the space for, for, for us to get out of that uh, state of constant survival? Because I think it's very hard to progress in, in, in a state like that. Yet it, it has been our, you know, our state for a long time. And, and how do we get out of this? And I know it's a, of course, it's an economical problem. Of course it's, but yeah, then again, it's to think about it and see where, where we have leverage. Cause this is, this is what I'm mostly interested in. Where, where's the little space that I have leverage to move, you know, to move things and, 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 and of course the stories that I'm gonna tell will be connected to that more, you know, even if it's a little space, you know, to, to, to do things differently and that will make us behave differently to each other and within the country. I, I want to stay there, you know? And why, why do you see that leverage now, right now, Jessica? Or do you, do you even see it? It's a 24 hours, you know, you have to renew it every day. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it doesn't last long. <laughs> some days you see it and then some days it disappears. And I've seen it when we were all together, when we are all together working, I see it. When you see it, should you remember? And this is something, and that's what keeps me in that country also. It's because I need to be reminded of that on a daily basis. Like I need to be reminded that this, we are is way more than a few words in, in, on the page of paper. And you're reminded of that when you go in the countryside, when you meet people and they open their house for you, give you food. And when you're about to pay them, they're like, what are you doing? You know, like, it's not about that. They even remind you that it's not about that, you know? And so you, you're reminding of that when you're making a project and you don't have enough resources and people just gather in a country where people are making less than a dollar a day. They gather to, 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 to help you make it. So you need this reminder. And, and, and this is what keeps the flame of believing in the people, you know, and believing that those 100 or 200 or 300 people that are controlling our narrative right now are not the 12 million or, you know, so to detach and to, to constantly, and, and even from ourselves, you know, from people outside of the situation that are, of course, way more scared because it, it looks even you know, harder and more difficult from outside, the, the, their fear, sometimes, you know, you're in a, uh, imprisoned by their fear and you have to, so it's, it's yeah, ma'am, it's, it, it's, it's an everyday <laughs> struggle, but hey, it's like when you, you brush your teeth every morning. So this is something that you need to do every morning, you know, a reminder of, 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 of why and how, you know, and, I, I want to leave time for plenty of questions, but um, I probably will want to go two more rounds um, with you all. And one of them is about what Joel Dreyfus calls uh, a cage of words. Um, and an essay that he wrote many years ago that was published in uh, The Butterfly's Way, this anthology I'd edited. And he, he wrote, I call it the phrase, and it comes up almost every time Hades mentioned in the news, the poorest nation in the Western hemisphere, these seven words represent a classic example of something absolutely true and absolutely meaningless at the same time. The phrase is a box, a metaphorical prison. 
Um, how do we get out of that metaphorical prisons, but all the others as well? Do you all have any uh, suggestions? We could start, Marlena, if you could start. I mean, I would love to, I, I would love to know um, specifically, I think I have more suggestions about some of the other metaphorical prisons, but the phrase, I'm, I'm baffled when I see it. I continue to see it in the New York Times. I, to this day, I continue to see it in the Washington Post. I don't know how many times we have to say it's dehumanizing because you could say the United States, the most violent country of the 21st century. I'm just that you could say anything about a country and repeat it over and over again. That would be true, but also meaningless as, as uh, Joelle said. So I don't, I don't know where the disconnect is if it's just what people are, they actually don't know that that's offensive. They've somehow missed that. Um, we have to keep repeating it every few years, but as I, I mean, I've seen a resurgence of it. I saw it in articles published after the ransom piece. Um, so I, I don't know how to get, oh, how, how do we get out of that prison when I have seen people defend that phrasing saying again, because it is true as if everything that might be, which it's only true depending on how you look at it, which is where the reframing comes in, because there was very, very rich people in Haiti, very, very rich people in Haiti, as um, Gina Louise is always pointing out about all the millionaires in Haiti. So it only, it, only some people in Haiti are experiencing uh, the quote unquote poorest country. Um, the, the other metaphorical prisons, I think uh, there was a piece in the Atlantic about Vodou, um, recently Nadej Green, I think it was, who wrote the piece, um, talking, you know, I think, I think pieces like that are helpful. I think, um, but I don't, I don't know of the material effect. So I would leave it to others to say, but I do think that we have narrative power in our voices and the art and in, in what we create. And I do see that there, that the needle is moving. Um, I would like it to move faster, but I'll try to be more patient. Um, but but I'm interested in what others have to say about sort of um, getting out of the linguistic and metaphorical prisons that Haiti continuously finds itself in since the 18th since since narratives of the country started to emerge. Really, I think there are some people in in the in, in the group of people that are organizing this conversation actually that are working on things like that, and I think one of the one of the most powerful things is really to just write and push things out. And uh, th this is one of one of the aspects that I think the diaspora can actually really take over and, 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 and not, not even helping, but really take, you know, a huge, like create this, this space of, of making stories, everything, whether it's an article, books, whether to come from Haiti and, and, and to take place and, and, and even if there is a, a huge production of, of, of literature, for example, from Haiti, but it tends to go um, 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 more to friends. It tends to go more, you know, to, uh, more to friends from my um, point of view. And I'm sure Edwidge can give more information about that. And I think it's, it's about making it, and, and, and those that actually traveled are not all of it, you know, it's just part of it. And, Someone, I remember I was somewhere and someone was saying, how can we help, how can we help? I said, just create space for the voices to exist. And, and listen. Like, <laughs> and, and yes, because it's true that we don't have political leverage to go to the New York Times and say, blah, blah, blah. And you take that down, whatever, I don't know. I don't even know if we had money, if we would have been able to do it, you know? But I think it's really to create that space for us and, for the outside, and because once we start talking and in, in, you know, saying things differently, it will have this effect within our community, and all the production also that will come out will have this flavor. Will have the flavor, of, and I and I wish not to be whether in the side of justifying something or I, I, I'm just trying to you know exist, just exist. Not the best, not the worst. It's not about. It's about we are there and we are. The, and, and this is one aspect of what is happening there. And to make that exist, 
I think this this is extremely important, and some people are doing it. It's and it's something that really needs to be to grow bigger and bigger. And of course, it's delicate because there's point of view because objectivity is complicated when when you're a huge group of people. Because how do we decide? You know, um, 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 censorship or whatever that can happen in this. But whatever it is, we need to try it. We need to try it fully. You know, not just with you know create small groups but really that's one of the thing i think of course it's not all but i think that's that's one of the things so on the cage of word i'll try to go really fast um in, in france we, we hear it but we have also you know these 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 words and i will put in it republic universalism <laughs> liberty equality fraternity so the, this way of arranging the world to, to fit a certain vision of self and of one's place in the world of you know one country as roles as bearer of the enlightenment and another country as you know um, the, a country that has plunged that has always been in darkness and that is in need of help and and in as in any classical tragedy you have very defined acts and roles you have the heroes the, the leading man the traitors the great battles the the sacrifices the gift and you have these words that help you define and kind of crystallize this for history and for a longer time what everyone's role is in France, we don't learn about the first, just, just to give you an example, we don't learn about the um, abolition of 1794. It, it was in the US that I learned of 1794. We celebrate 1848 because to teach us about 1794 is to have to explain to us that as a country of the enlightened, when we reinstated slavery. And to me, this cage of words, something like, hey, you know, this insistence, almost insane insistence of not calling Haiti Haiti, but the poorest country in the hemisphere is on in the northern hemisphere, participate in this. You know, in, in France, we call it la, la blanchisserie république and this whitening of history and this uh, removal of any point of history that shall remain unknown and who's, you know, kind of coming out of the darkness and the silence that has been um, kept for centuries will question all the thought, all this history and, you know, pride that we had in our history. So Haiti has to be kept in darkness and just put in, in you know, in, um, in, in silence and just describe in those seven words that, you know, are a door that should be closed and prevents any curiosity. But what I'm seeing right now is a generational shift, a true generational shift. When I visit um, journalism school from Northern France, to Brown in the in the US, to Portugal, there is a new generation that is starting to be aware of the, the weight of these words. We're not just talking about seven words, we're talking about a cloud that replicates that replicates the, some, some of the historical traumas. So that's here and also seeing what's happening, um, you know, activism, um, the works of the diaspora on social media. I have, I have hope. And again, we hope that this might happen before our physical body leaves this, this earth. But we are now asking this question. And to me, it's, it means that, again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm taking little baby steps that something is moving, not fast enough, but something is moving. Mm -hmm. So for, I want to, before we go into the audience for questions, um, talk about some solutions, what each of us can do in terms of reframing our own narratives um, as Haitians, even in our own personal spaces with the, the Yafini narrative, with the Numodi narrative, we, we do it too. Um, so I, what, what are the ways that we can reframe the narrative and I mean, I think one of the ways, and uh, it was mentioned already, is, is by, by Jessica, is by supporting our storytellers, by encouraging like our the next generation, our young people to not be, you know, Haiti seems amorphous to them too. They're like, I'm back up run, but, you know, it's like, can I step in there to kind of encourage them with these by keeping our stories alive in many different ways. So what can we do? And there's a lot in the chat too about healing, about ways 
of healing all this generational trauma and the, with, um, I think Professor Degas mentioned the Laku and, and all these things that have gotten us to survive in, you know, throughout the ages, but also in diaspora. So how do we change the narrative starting with us um, as well? And then, you know, going outward, like what are some things, like some concrete things we can take away with in terms of reframing narratives? So I can, I can start. Um, as a Black French person who discovered uh, that one could be Black and French at 26, um, as someone who heard for the first time the name Fanon in an American institution, someone who heard for the first time the name Marie Scondé, someone who heard for the first time the name Aimé Césaire, someone who heard for the first time that Haiti was Saint-Domingue and it was the richest colony in the universe, in, 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 um, uh, for, for France, discovering all of this, hearing about Haiti, learning about Haiti, its history, its complicated history, its complexity and its present is essential to understand what it is to be black in, in France. It's absolutely essential. And today there's a generation of scholars, of artists, of writers in France who are diving into that, trying to understand that um, to be black within this project, within the European modernist project is to live on the fringe of official narratives. It's, it has been for us to exist in the dead angles and silence, but it also meant that we're not alone. And to make this, and it goes to what, what Marlene said, right, for her diving into this history in the 19th century and realized that even there, people were not silent, right? They, they found ways to bring this history or bits of this history of these stories to us. And um, there's also a lot of despair. It's a different kind of despair. You know, when I talk to, uh, to cousins and aunts and people in, in the banlieues in, in these ghettos in France about the situation here, um, in, in, at least in France. But to, when we realize that sometimes you're in the, it's almost as if you're droning and um, a chord has been sent to you. And this is an example that I use because it's personal, it's mine, but more and more I'm seeing it around me that for us black people in France, that chord, that thing that is preventing us from drowning into this racist, dehumanizing system that in France, that cord is Haiti, that rope is Haiti, trying to understand what Haiti meant for the history of black people in the world. And the ways that we find, you know, from our little scale, uh, personal scale, is to de developing, um, you know, networks, connections with artists, with writers, um, at, at very, you know, these are very um, small levels. But, but from what I'm seeing, and this is what the, the topic of the book that I'm working, that I'm working on right now with the introduction chapter on this, on, on the relationship between us and Haiti from the past to present. It's how it's enlightening us, how it's helping us literally survive a system that is smothering us. Um, and yes, yeah, smothering dreams, smothering aspirations and, and making us, you know, trying to, to disappear. So, and this is really at a, like you say, Jessica, it's every day. It's a twenty-four hours uh, type of work. Questions that you work, that you are, you know, that we keep asking to to each other. But yeah, for the past five years, this this rope for me has been absolutely um, Haiti and and just you know. Yeah. I would say, um, I think supporting Haitian-led organizations in Haiti, the United States, in finding the people who are working in local communities. Um, and I think for me um, in, in the scholarly world, the Haitian Studies Association, um, I think is doing such vital work in terms of there's the training that happens at your institution with your advisors, but there's a less visible training that, that happens outside of that realm at conferences and in mentoring with people outside of your university and the Haitian Studies uh, association for me and for so many of the scholars of my generation who all first met each other there, found our support networks there, 
when people were telling us that uh, what we're writing wasn't important, it didn't matter, we were never going to get a job. That's what many of us were told over and over again. Um, and I just think about how many dissertations and books and articles that have advanced the, the narrative forward, including on the indemnity, but also on the Duvalier era, on uh, social institutions in Haiti today that wouldn't have been written if people listened to their advisors and not to the mentors they found in places like the Haitian Studies Association and to support scholars in Haiti, which HSA has been doing and holding the conference um, in Haiti when possible and making sure that as we are reframing the narrative, it is really a we, all of us um, together and not, um, I, you know, I take Jean Casimir and other scholars, their points very seriously. It can't become a replica of the imperialism where it's just about kind of extracting and extracting the narratives out. It actually has to be um, for collective storytelling and for the collective good. And so I would say um, also supporting Haitian journalists share their articles, um, share Aibo Post articles, um, share, you know, Haitian Times articles, share the, share the works of the scholars who, uh, like Etan Dupin, who get their pieces into CNN um, and make sure that people hear their voices because they are also on the ground doing reporting that is not just, you know, from afar um, and telling us what is happening um, today, those of us who are far away. So, so that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. um, we have also in, oh, Jessica, go ahead. No, I'm not going to Oh, my God. I'm not going to No, what I, what I quickly wanted to say is something that I've been trying to do because it's, it's so terribly hard is to, to look at myself, my surrounding, my community, my people, and not through what they think of us. And that's, some, that, that, that's a huge prison that, uh, you know, I've been in, I'm trying to talk for myself, not to generalize, so I've, I've been in where you're obsessed about, oh, if, if this, you know, if this goes out like that, what are they going to take of us, you know, and the shame and to continue uh, the, the culture of, you know, being ashamed of who you are and constantly um, balancing that shame through what they think or whatever. And so trying now to look at myself, to look at w what I am really, and to accept it, not necessarily to, I don't know, to make it part of my life or whatever, but to, to, to understand and accept that this is what it is right now. It's like making an assessment of who we are as a nation and as right now, you know, as a community right now. And, and make peace with that and work with, within our community and not constantly thinking about, you know, what, what does this white people said about us or what? It's like a trap. It's like, almost like I feel those seven words that you talk about, I feel like they do it so we, they, to distract us from being <laughs> where we are supposed to be, which is with our community and, and focusing on, on, on the growth, the little growth that we are trying to gain day after day, so we can elevate ourselves from, from, from what's going on. And I feel like we, we are constantly being this track, you know, it's, it's that we are set up this, avoid you know, to make you step. And, and I, 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 I don't want them to trap me like that, even in my films, not because I have a problem with white people, or whatever, but I'm, I try not to put them. You know, if I if I have a character of someone that is not, you know, living in Haiti, I will make it like a shadow. You know, because I'm like you're a shadow. You're a shadow that is constantly trying to push me to a place that I don't want to be because we want to be in the process of healing. And now, you, how do you heal when someone is constantly harassing you, bullying you, and you're letting that have access to you? And I don't want them to have that access. I remember when I met Duvanjou with my motor, I told him, there's no white people in this. I know we're talking about colonialism and what it's about, but it's about us, what is doing to us right now. It's it's no more. They've made countless, yeah, there are books, there are everything that is being made about you know what happened before. There they need to be people making what what is what is that doing to us right now in our daily basis. And even at the, you know, at the end of the film, because we film a little bit in, in Florida, 
and we said we, we saw a little white man walking and he was like do you want me to go and I said no not to that extreme but you get the point <laughs> and so, so I tried to do it I tried to do it in everything and again it's not from a place of hating or whatever it's a, it's it's a place of let's look at ourselves and ourselves only and what we're going through right now I, you know and and, and 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 push them away as they pushed us away they made us disappear and it worked because for more than 100 years, nobody even know, we were not even in the you know, French dictionary, like um, what's hate, you know? So I, I want us to make them disappear like that in our narrative, at least, because yeah, that's, that's where we have power. And that's, that's, that's what I'm trying to do, you know, to, to think about it, even in my conversation, workshop, whatever I'm doing, I try not to mention it, even if it's hard, because the neocolonialism is still there and you're like, ugh. But you're like, for us that has the space, the mental space to do it, it's almost a duty. It's almost a duty because some of us, you know, doesn't have that privilege. So I'm trying to consider the fact that I have the privilege to create a space of, you know, make that disappear. And, and I'm trying to use it for myself and my work. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's what you're saying is so reminds me a lot of what, you know, Toni Morrison's. Uh, vision of the, the white gaze and how she talks about racism being so distracting because you're you're spending so so much time like trying okay. to prove your humanity that the you're not like you're you're, you're not leaving that it. time is being taken away from the work you need to to be doing and I, I think that often happens to us in our sort of like in our responsive stance where when we're like responding like sort of even like reframing the narrative by trying to go counter to the narrative is by unsuddenly responding. But there are some really great uh, suggestions in the, the chat from Professor de Graff about one way that we reframe the narrative is by rewriting our history books, I assume from our own perspective and Creole Lang Racine. And someone said to start spelling IT, IT, the indigenous way. Um, and tell about the Haiti you know. It's singular, it's yours, but to tell and also teach our children about the culture. Um, so I want to ask some of the questions that are starting to, to show. And one of them is, um, I guess, sort of goes back to the center of this conversation. Uh, we grazed that a little bit uh, earlier. What is the narrative of Haiti from the Haitian perspective? Like, what would that be? Someone, I can't tell the person because it was going fast, but I noted it. Well, there isn't one, there are many. And I think that is the, that is that sort of underscoring that is a way to, um, it basically by underscoring the fact that the narratives from Haiti coming from within Haiti and from Haitians are multiple underscores how singular the dominant narrative wants to be, but actually never has been because um, Haitians were, have been writing their own history actually since before Haiti existed as a recognized nation state. Um, the people who are now and are the descendants of Haitians are uh, the earliest Haitians have been writing these stories and they were read. Um, Toussaint Louverture's memoirs were of course brought to the 19th century by Joseph Saint-Rémy in, in highly edited form um, and then translated into English and circulated around. And I think it's really important because um, it speaks to the fact that if you want to know the story, you could always have known this. You must deliberately try not to know the story um, of Toussaint Louverture in the 19th century because everyone was talking about it. England was talking about it. Um, and, and so I would say that bringing more of those stories to light, um, the stories from the past, um, and not replicating what dominant people who Expo, expound dominant um, theories do, which is to cr try to create a singular narrative, the founding fathers. Well, there's in Haiti, there are people who we resist in some ways saying the founders because of exactly, it doesn't, ex it doesn't expose the participation of the people who are always the ones um, who built 
the, the state. And even CLR James in his later prefaces to the Black Jacobins and in speeches he gave in the 60s and 70s talked about how he regretted focusing so much on one singular individual to send Arthur in the Black Jacobins because at the at the expense of the 10,000 Louvertures who General Leclerc was so afraid of because after the arrest, that was the phrase. We got rid of Louverture, but there are 10,000 Louvertures. And so remembering that each of those people, which were many more than 10,000, had a story to tell and still have a story to tell um, and, it, and they're important stories. And so I would say there's not one narrative. There's so many that we could possibly never capture them all. Hmm. And, and Marlene, you, you were talking specifically about narratives coming from, from Haiti, but I am thinking about how narratives also from the diaspora on how Haiti, right, from the history to the present inspired. Um, it's also very interesting in, in how it, those two productions can help catch in a vice those, the dominant Western narrative of, you know, uh, destruction, malediction, poorest country. So it's also very interesting. And this is what I'm seeing more and more in conferences that I've been attending in the past years around Pan-Africanist um, productions and, uh, and more and more seeing a, a displacement from a very US-centric construction of blackness, right? Construction of blackness that is um, uh, coming from words, concept theories from African-American and a displacement. It, it started as very, it started kind of slowly, but I'm seeing it more and more, an opening you know, going to, toward Haiti. So the, with the hope that, as you say, these two production coming together, both um, the narrative coming from, the narratives, this is also very important to produce in plural, coming from inside Haiti and the narratives about the important centrality of Haiti from the Afro, you know, the, the, the Afro, uh, African diaspora could help um, minimize or at least show that there's, there's some uh, all the stories are here and they, they need to be told too. And also there, there's something that that I always think about it might might feel really light or you know not because when you when you think about for I example, like when how you say oh this is something to going to be very light and you drop a bomb. <laughs> yes, it's it's really light. Say, okay, this may sound and it's like bomb. <laughs> It's really light because when you think about listen, when you think about the American dream, it's something that we've all come to believe in, and people go there because they truly believe in that, and they're ready to lose their life. It's like a common belief, you know, that was collectively um, um, people agreed within the country and outside of it, and it was so powerful. And I always think about, of course, we have the first, you know, being the first Black Republic. And, that's a common belief that we have and that we we go to and that we hold on to. And I said, maybe also it's time to create one for for now, you know, something now that if, that we are building toward, you know, even if it's not a reality, because we all know that the American dream is not true for everyone and that the American sea, you know, has many people that didn't get to, you know, uh, achieve that dream. But still, it stayed there because it's a possibility and it's something that, maybe they are working towards or whatever, but I said, what can we create for ourselves? You know, what, what belief that can we create that we can work toward to, and that we collectively say, and that we collectively work together to make, to make happen. And, and this is something that, that, that I think about also, because they, they, they dare to do it, even though they know it's not true, even though they know it has a lot of flaws, they dare to, do, to, to think it, and people follow along in that, you know, complete um, 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 idea. Yeah. What you say is not light. It's it's very important. I'm thinking about you know the, one of the last time I heard Jean Damiri talk here. Uh, little French kids, mostly black and Arab, were looking at him like, I mean, this looks like a Hollywood movie. And when he was talking about the Haitian Revolution, and in their minds, as 14 years old, this has all the hallmarks of a great action movie, of a Hollywood mm -hmm. movie. Mm -hmm. But how come we never heard about that? I mean, this is how myths are constructed. You were talking about voodoo, Marlin, how even if these things are, are, are what they are, myth, right? They never really happened, but mm -hmm. how true um, 
cinematic machine like Hollywood or uh, les, les studios pâté in France, we are creating this myth and have people believe in it. And we, and in our case, we don't have to even have to create them. The stories are already here. And I talk about it when I see this 14 year old say, oh my God, how come I never heard these are badass, they did that, right? So it has all the hallmarks of a Hollywood movies and we need to make it continue making it happen through these little, it was a very small circle with 15 kids, but I'm sure that on that day, Jean d'Amérique made something, you know, a mm -hmm. seed was planted in these little kids' brains, so yeah, these little kids' heads. We have to dare, we have to dare, telling what we want to, you know, and not letting them make us feel ashamed of, of things, because this is, the shame has worked a lot also in, you know, in making us hiding, not knowing what to express, um, 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 and 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 work, how to define ourselves because we are never sure if which one we know is the shame, the shame, the shame, and to own it, it's power. And it, of course, you know it's cliche to say that, but it is power to own it, whatever flaw you know that it might have, and how, however not so beautiful or so bright that it might be, you know, to own it, like not to allow them to make us feel ashamed of it, and. Or oh, even go back to something that you said at the beginning of this talk, displace the embarrassment. The embarrassment is not mine to have now. I'm going to, we go, it's going to either be shared or it will be all yours to take. And, mm -hmm. and yes, we, we have to think of how to make that happen. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, another question is uh, about vision, an ideal, I think it's from, um, Marie-Francoise, what is, what is the vision? What's, What's an ideal to a, what's an ideal to aspire to, or some ideal to aspire to, especially given what is happening in the country right now, which is always, even if we're not directly discussing it in the forefront of our minds, uh, how do, what, what, what is the vision looking back and forward at the same time? I think. I think this is where back to mom's kind of healing because well, the, he, the, the practices, but also to the larger concept of hope because, you know, even though I sometimes want to rail against hope myself and, you know, what is it, what is it, you know, we can't just hope alone at the same time. I think what if the people, um, you know, in Saint-Domingue had ever given up hope um, when I read that Les Affiches Américaines and all the marron, as they called them, who are leaving all the time in the hopes of having freedom, um, I do, I, I think that that has to be a part of the vision, if not the central piece of it. And that's what I think in these years to come, whether in Haiti or in the United States or in France, where the, with the growing um, right-wing sentiment, gun violence all the time here as well. We talk about violence in Haiti, but we have extreme violence, as we all know, in the United States at this moment, every single day. And um, the other, because the opposite of hope is what despair, and that to me leads to inaction. And so, um, so I would say that that would be my vision right now, what we need to keep in mind. Um, another question is how can we use uh, Black Lives Matter to our advantage, what would that look like? Hmm. I know you've written about that, Marlena, in terms of Haiti, uh, your framing, um, which is also reframing the narrative as Haiti is sort of the home, the motherland of Black Lives Matter in, in a certain way. So maybe you can, you can, both, you can all definitely, ma'am, to uh, address that. Claudine Michel, I think, was the one who first said that. I just want to give credit where credit is. I remember Claudine. he said, Haiti is the birth of Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. um, but but I think um, I think it's true, but I think it's incredibly difficult to watch what is happening with Black Lives Matter in the US right now, falling out of, we saw the resurgence after the killing of George Floyd, and then to see that there's actually a backlash against um, Black Lives Matter at this moment is um, disheartening and reminds me of the kind of salutary support for the Haitian revolution, but then actually undermining of the Haitian state consistently. And um, 
And so I'll leave it to others to say what, where, what direction they think is going in at present. Mm -hmm. Mom, Jessica. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking because, Mom, you, you wanna say something? Are you, are you gonna say something? I'm gonna ramble, I'm gonna ramble. I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, first of all, it's very complex, of course, because all the expression of, of blackness, can I say that? Blackness is different mm -hmm. from one country to the other, one situation, one. But if you're thinking about it on a human level, not in keeping it, you know, in, in, in the society level and, and how the dynamic makes it, you know, exist in each society. If you're thinking about it on the human level, of course, the way we position ourselves. <laughs> but the thing is that freedom is hard. And I think this is another thing that, you know, I grew up, I grew up listening to that freedom. The way you think about freedom, you know, you think about yourself running in some field, you know, having your arms like completely in the, in the wind and being free, free, it feels like something very, you know, light and, 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 and beautiful that you just want to walk toward to. And, and I feel like, it, I don't know if it's, I'm constructing something in my head to justify things, but in Haiti, I feel like, I, I feel like this is the place where I understand what freedom is, because this is the, the, <laughs> the exact thing that that a system doesn't want you to have the freedom to whatever it is to exist the way you think you to have perception on yourself whatever doesn't work toward one global you know um, um, um movement is not welcomed so when you dare to exist it, it it's hard to be aware but it needs to be aware of the consequences of, if i can call it consequences because it will have and, and in the article, again, it shows you how we had to fight to keep that freedom, how they kept coming, you know, and, 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 and staying around and say, if you don't, if you don't, I'm going to take it away from you. And it's something that we constantly trying to do. How do we keep that freedom? There's winning it. And of course, there's keeping it. And of course, there's how do you continue, you know, to make it grow and make it look like something that people can aspire to instead of something that people say, you know what, I might as well stay where I am, you know, with my problems, I don't want that type of, and they turned us into that in the Caribbean. I mean, we all know that, that they used us as, you know, for a long time as the example of what freedom can, 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 can turn a, a, a whole nation into. And, and also this is something that we have to claim to understand that the choice of being free as a nation has this consequence, but you will never hear Haitians say, oh, we should have never fight then. Because this, this has to stay the way it is. The fight to, to be human has to stay the way it is. And it's, it's, this is the hard part. And to accept the, the, the heart that is coming, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that it has to be that dramatic because we don't need all this drama right now that we're going through, but there will be resistance and, and huge resistance, you know, for this to exist and to be a fully, fully an example of what freedom can really be, you know, when, when people fight for it and, and, and really take it um, um, and not waiting for someone to give it uh, to them because it's never given anyway. So yeah. Yeah. So I think that this question highlights the um, and 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 um and when I read it, you know, with with your your take on the link with understanding what freedom is, the cost of um, seeking freedom and the cost of trying to maintain freedom, oh. I think it highlights the importance of um, building global networks and and transnational like, you know, those transnational bridges. And this is something, you know, that I do a lot when I tell my students to, if they can't physically travel, to look at, um, to observe how anti-Blackness um, work outside of the boundaries of their own country or of the place where we are. What are the mechanisms of, of anti-Blackness in, in the localities where you are or the localities that you're studying? What is the quality of silence, right, of invisibility around Blackness in the places where we are? And 
I cannot, I mean, this is something that I say a lot and I cannot stress how pivotal my being in the US has been for my understanding of negrophobia in France and how my understanding of blackness and, and freedom and the tie between color and freedom in Haiti had been for understanding my position as a black person in, in France. And, you know, I think it was Anne Joseph Gabriel who said that anti-blackness is a global disease that cannot go away with a local remedy. But what one thing that we can do with the local remedy is to see how you know, the, the, when I talk of the quality of blackness, I think it, it rings with Annette just said, the tie with freedom, what it means to be, for me to be, to evolve as a black person, a black woman in Paris, in Port-au-Prince, in, in Dakar, in Puerto Rico, and what are the connections that we can, so for, for me as a person growing up in France, I see the connections and what I can get from Haiti, and now what we are doing in our work is to make this, you know, a two-way street, right? What, what are, you know, when you look at a movement like La Verité pour Adama or the dozens um, anti-police uh, violence, you know, working to restore justice, get justice for black people getting murdered in France, what can people in Haiti, right, learn or get from these, these movements? Because so far it has been heavily a one-way street, right? So yeah, mm. this, is, this mm. is the vision, really strengthening this, this transnational routes at the, at the very intimate, um, you know, small circle level that I think are the most effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, we're going to probably have to, this could go on forever, but we're going to have to stop soon. Uh, there, can you each give us some final words before we turn back to our to our gracious hosts who have uh, made this conversation possible? Some final words, but like sending us out with some great motivation to go out and reframe the narrative. Our narrative. I'm grateful, Edwidge. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for you all. And I think maybe we don't realize how just to see someone holding in their area gives you strength to hold where you are also because you understand the struggle and it's different and and i'm grateful to have access to this conversation because all those women that are on this panel and all of them that have organized this are people that i highly admire and Every time that I see them, that they are holding, that they are not letting go, this is my strength. This is my strength. And I've been blessed the, during the whole year of traveling with this film to meet women and women, so many of them. I don't know what energy is going on, but they've been coming in. And it's a reminder of the beauty, you know? It's a reminder of the beauty because you need to be reminded of the beauty, otherwise you go crazy and you're, you, you, you know, you're trapped in the, in the pain. And I'm extremely, extremely, extremely grateful for that. Extremely grateful for people that still want to listen and talk about it. And that still find the drive to, you know, to not letting go and commenting. And so I hope all of you continue to produce and continue to do everything that you're doing in, in whatever field that you are because it nourishes someone somewhere all the time, all the time, all the time. This is something that we should never forget. And, and it nourishes me. And thank you for that. And thank you for this great conversation. I, am, I was not in that state before I started. I was really, <laughs> things were locked, you know? And now I feel some opening. I'm gonna try to keep it for more than 24 hours because it has been hard to keep it <laughs> for longer than that. But I have hope. I can come back to it in my mind, and I'm and I'm grateful for that. Yeah, I mean, I I think someone wrote that it's um, it the space feels sacred. I mean, I think it's these conversations can be can be healing um, mm. to for us to gather. And you feel like papukotu, like we're not alone. That's that's the yeah. also a space of gratitude. Um, thank you all. I just want to thank you. It's, I'm honored to be here to share this space with you, to share this space with the audience. I wish I could read all of your chats that I see that have been very robust. Um, 
you know, we say Mal Pil Shaipalu. I believe that's true. And I hope um, I want to collaborate with all of you and move the conversation and the action forward. Mm -hmm. La même chose ici, the same, you know, really um, happy um, to, to, to be here, lots of gratitude and um, we, we eat and drink with, this is how we get, I mean, it's the fuel, right, to keep on going when everything around you says, no, wrong direction, don't do this. And, um, you know, this is, we need the, the, this circle um, because, you know, listening to people who have this knowledge, people who, who, who know, who, or who've been studying, um, you know, different ways of crossing the world and ways that had been long considered to be vectors of contamination, vectors of replacement, vectors of danger, and say that there's something to be learned, right, from people who've long engaged into these practices. And, and, and for us, you know, members of the diaspora looking at this history as something, this story as something that, that you know, gives us wings, something that gives us um, pride in, in being black, in being, in being, right? And, and also listen what it means to be also able to learn from this history um, without doing it in, in a, you know, and, and doing it in a manner that unsettles accepted genealogies of thought and also without recreating the extractivist relations of domination or erasures of, you know, activists, indigenous or and white scholars so it's um i'm very very happy and grateful to be here with you and yeah. merci beaucoup <laughs> yeah merci merci marlena merci ma merci jessica and thank you to all of you for for joining i will now bring leonie uh, yes. back to the virtual stage as they say mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you Thank you everyone for joining us for part two of the Ransom Haiti Stolen um, Wealth series, Reframing Our Narrative. We'd like to give a special thank you to the interpreting team who did the Creole interpretation. Um, the, it's Marb based out of Miami and we wanna give a shout out to Debbie Lourdes and Martine who did an excellent job in interpretation, in, in translation. A special, special, special thank you to you, our national treasure, Edwidge Dantica, um, and Miami resident. We, we have her now. <laughs> uh, thank you for moderating this incredible conversation. Um, and, you know, to our speakers, uh, Jessica Genius, Dr. Marlene Doubt, uh, Marlena Doubt, and Dr. Mam uh, Fatunyang, you know, gratitude most profound for this, you know, just incredible, incredible conversation. Um, you know, when the, when the newspaper series came out, we sort of said, we got to do something. We have to have that conversation. We have to talk to one another whether it's a you know book club format, but you know we came together um, these you know multiple organizations and we decided to um, you know plan and execute this series, which of course I think I could speak for all of you you know Haitian Ladies Network and all the partners that this series truly exceeded our expectation. Um, and, and bringing, you know, people will say, well, why, why, why these women? We did not set out to create a group of female panelists, but it's just that each and every one of us wanted to hear from you. And so, you know, for all the men out there, it's not that we said, well, you know, we gotta have women only. No, it was just that these women have been such powerful speakers. They have, you know, they have, thought they have thought about it, um, analyzed, written books about it, that we thought it was really an ideal group to sort of uh, listen and, and, and boy, did we, did we um, you know, we're, we're not, when we were truly impressed by the caliber of the conversation, the depth of the conversation, how we're moved to action, moved to really understanding this whole idea of redefining, <laughs> reframing, and recreating the narrative. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you. 
Um, uh, once again, I, I just want to uh, name again who we are. Uh, we are a collective of Haitian and Black-led organizations. We are Haitian Ladies Network, the Black Collective, Haitian, the Haitian American Foundation for Democracy, Saint La Haitian Neighborhood Center, Island TV, Ibo Post, Haitian American Professional Coalition, HAPC, and Avancé Assam. This is not over. The conversation continues. Join us next week for part three. Uh, what's next? Repairing Haiti and global movement for reparation. It's going to happen next Tuesday. We started the conversation already. <laughs> next Tuesday, July 19th at 7 p.m. Um, we will ex explore the continuing impact of the double debt and U.S. occupation of Haiti on Haiti today and connect, the and connect to the global movement for reparation. And so uh, we would also encourage you uh, if you haven't, Mon if you haven't uh, registered, please do so. And we would also want to ask you, um, we want to hear from you. So we want to ask you to take just a couple of minutes to complete a brief survey um, that has been dropped in the chat. Uh, please uh, complete it. it. It's very important to us. Um, it helps us understand, you know, this is new to us. So what can we do? What else can we do? And so we really encourage you to come to fill it out. Um, so that's it. Uh, again, on behalf of this collective of organizations, you know, again, the narrative is we don't work together. Women can't work together. We can do th this together. And this is an absolute uh, proof that we do work together. We can work together, whether we're here in Haiti or wherever in the diaspora, we do work together. So again, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to the moderator. Truly an honor. So à la semaine prochaine, next week, same time, same Zoom panel, Zoom platform. Bye-bye. <laughs> do you think it's possible to save the chat 